Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the week's gone well. Let me start with macro thoughts. Oil price action this time around is worse for longs than what we saw post the Aramco attack. That's from the market here. We're currently at 59.40. We got below 59. And uh, as I wrote in that article of mine, the assassination, I expected oil to come off the boil this week, which is what has subsequently happened. Home thoughts, the beauty of Twitter is that you can have two sets of diametrically opposite lunatics going after you for the same tweet. Karl R. E. Marx. Sussex plunged into anarchy as ruling family's departure leaves power vacuum. That's Joshua Keating, tongue in cheek. It's quite interesting as to how people look at the situation. It's very binary. Getting the best sunrise view Kenya has to offer at Ol Malo, somewhere in Laikipia. That's via Jambo magazine. And that sunrise photograph took me to some other sunrise photographs. This is one I took at Diani Beach, Rise and Shine. This is another one I took at Fairmont, Mount Kenya, sunrise tinting the clouds. And Mount Kenya is in the background. Uh, whilst we were there, there were these tremendous drummers, and I tweeted, drummers with groove. And I wrote a piece a few years ago, Fairmont, Mount Kenya in Nanuki became a mecca for the international jet set. That story is about William Holden, Stephanie Powers and the history behind Mount Kenya, which is still a favorite destination of all of ours. And whenever you visit, what I like about it is people tend to visit with their parents, their children, their grandparents. It's really quite remarkable. So that it is easy to count those cubs, the sites which will make conservationists elated, a happy tiger family on a walk received via WhatsApp. That's Parveen Kaswan, who's a conservationist in India, and posts some really interesting photographs and commentary. This is a magical picture. Count the cubs with the tigress. Uh, PC, uh, Siddharth Singh, Magical Terai, that's Parveen again. And uh, uh, Kaushik uh, C. Basu, who I also follow as an economist, tweeted a portrait of Satyajit Ray in Bangalore. And my favorite movie is Charu Lata, which is a 1964 Indian drama film written and directed by Satyajit Ray, based upon the novella Nasta Near the Broken Nest by Rabindranath Tagore. And one of the reasons I love that movie is for a little episode when she's on a swing. And uh, it reminds me of that poem by Kabir, The Swing, and it makes me think of my mother. The first full moon of the year is known as the Wolf Moon, brain picker. Um, can't think of anything lovelier than its hazy beauty to celebrate my new telescope and indeed I took a photograph of it a day before and it was very very luminous. Political reflections breaking on the invitation of the US side Chinese Vice Premier Liu Hie will lead China's trade delegation in the US from January 13 to 15 to sign the phase one trade deal the Chinese Ministry of Commerce pronounced. 23rd of December, I said the crossfire of a trade war, I was reflecting on the year, but I said it's now ebbing well for a few months because Trump has an election to win and Xi has an economy to rescue. And in response to Ian Bremer, I said, I expect a detente ahead of the election 
and the phase one deal signals as much because Trump wants to have a tailwind into the election and Xi has a problematic economy. China and the US will sign phase one trade deal. The deal can be seen as a new start to explore each other's boundary of behavior and tolerance. But if the two countries go to confrontation again, it will be idiocy of the mankind, says Hugh. Now, uh, Nassim Taleb tweeted a thread on US-Iran, an empire, say Rome, is built on an army that is self-financing. Military supremacy generates income. Division of specialization. If you are money-making, say the Phoenicians, then you don't need an army. You just pay whoever runs that business for protection. U.S. has a greater relative military capability in history. Makes no sense. Without exacting protection money, Europe pays little, even indirect, to with defiant states. Empire's model is to crush defiant states, plunder and parade Versing Versingetorix, Zenobia, Saddam. Iraq war had little to do with anything but model consistency, as with the Judean rebellion, punish insubordination, defiance, and reward economic submission. Clarity of mind, Trump figured out that business model requires direct punishment of the Iranian regime or change of model. And that took me back to Zygmunt Brzezinski, who said the three grand imperatives of imperial geostrategy um, are to prevent collusion, maintain security dependence among the vassals, keep tributaries pliant and protected, and to keep the barbarians from coming together. I like this from Karl Remarks, a test for every Middle East expert to be certified. What is the best falafel? Um Kaltum or Fairuz expand. The difference between Saudi and Qatari Thawb. Name nine different Christian sects. Favorite type of Arak. Fill a government form in five minutes pronounce Iran correctly. My choice would be Fairuz, and one of my favorite songs is Kifak Enter, the link for which is on Rich Wrap-Ups. <coughs> Last night I went back to two documentaries by Raghi Omar, Iran 1979, Anatomy of a Revolution, and Iran 1979, Legacy of a Revolution, both very good documentaries. Of course, my article was The Assassination, The Escalation of the Shadow War. I was quoting from Russia with Love, Blofeld, Reed Trump. Kronstein, you're sure this plan is foolproof? Kronstein, Reed Pompeo, yes it is, because I've anticipated every possible variation of counter move. Interesting article <clears throat> about which I can't verify or uh, affirm its bona fides. The deeper story behind the assassination of Soleimani Federico Piracini via the Strategic Culture Foundation. Days after the assassination of Soleimani, new and important information is coming to light from a speech given by the Iraqi Prime Minister. The Iraqi Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi has revealed details of his interactions with Trump in the weeks leading up to Soleimani's assassination in a speech to the Iraqi parliament. He tried to explain several times on live television how Washington had been browbeating him and other Iraqi members of parliament to toe the American line, even threatening to engage in false flag sniper shootings of both protesters and security personnel 
in order to inflame the situation, recalling similar modi operandi seen in Cairo in 2009, Libya in 2011, Maidan in 2014. The purpose of such cynicism was to throw Iraq into chaos. The Speaker of the Council of Representatives of Iraq, Halbusi, attended the parliamentary session while almost none of the Sunni members did. This was because the Americans had learned that Abdul Mehdi was planning to reveal sensitive secrets in the session and sent Halbusi to prevent this. Halbusi cut Abdul Mehdi off at the commencement of his speech and then asked for the live airing of the session to be stopped. After this, Halbusi, together with other members, sat next to Abdul Mehdi, speaking openly with him, but without it being recorded. This is what was discussed in that session that was not broadcast. Abdul Mehdi spoke angrily about how the Americans had ruined the country and now refused to complete infrastructure and electricity grid projects unless they were promised 50% of oil revenues, which Abdul Mehdi refused. This is why I visited China and signed an important agreement with them to undertake the construction instead. Upon my return, Trump called me to ask me to reject this agreement. When I refused, he threatened to unleash huge demonstrations against me that would end my premiership. Huge demonstrations against me duly materialized and Trump called again to threaten that if I did not comply with his demands, then he would have marine snipers on tall buildings, target protesters and security personnel alike in order to pressure me. I was supposed to meet Soleimani later in the morning when he was killed. He came to deliver a message from Iran in response to the message we had delivered to the Iranians from the Saudis. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was not consulted regarding the US strike. In light of the rapid developments, the Kingdom stresses the importance of exercising restraint to guard against all acts that may lead to escalation with severe consequences. Saudi Arabia sent a delegation to Washington to urge restraint with Iran on behalf of Persian Gulf states. The message will be, please spare us the pain of going through another war. The petrodollar is what ensures that the US dollar retains its status as the global reserve currency, granting the US a monopolistic position from which it derives enormous benefits from playing the role of regional hegemon. To threaten this comfortable arrangement is to threaten Washington's global power. The agreement between Iraq and China is a prime example of how Beijing intends to use the Iran-Iraq-Syria troika to revive the Middle East and link it with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Trump believed his drone attack could solve all his problems by frightening his opponents, winning the support of his voters by equating Soleimani's assassination to Osama bin Laden and sending a warning to Arab countries of the dangers of deepening their ties with China. 8th of April 2019, I said threats by any nation to undermine the petrodollar system are viewed by Washington as tantamount to a declaration of war against the US. In 21st century geopolitics, this is the granddaddy of all geopolitical red lines. So, sounds pretty likely to be frank. The world population has increased from 3 billion in 1960 to 7.5 billion today. The earth is hotter than at any time since the steam engine was invented. The last five years on earth have been hotter than at any time since the industrial revolution kicked off almost two centuries ago. That's the conclusion of Europe's Copernicus Climate Change Service 
which published data on Wednesday showing that global average temperatures since 2015 were some 1.2 degrees Celsius higher than when steam engines began powering industry. Last year was the second warmest on record after 2016. These are unquestionably alarming signs. Um, Copernicus Climate Change Service operates a network of satellites for the European Union that collects weather, soil, air and water data. 2019 was Europe's warmest year, marginally higher than temperatures in 2014, 2015 and 2018. Global average temperature in 2019 was 0.6 degrees Celsius warmer than the 1981 to 2010 average. Here you see a car driving through thick smoke from bushfires in Bemboka, New South Wales, Australia on January 5. And this is the running 60-month averages of global air temperature at a height of 2 metres, an estimated change since the pre-industrial period, again from Copernicus. 30th of September, I spoke about the end being nigh and the feedback loop and the risks of dieback where we enter a, fade, a phase of cascading system collapse. And I quoted Greta Thunberg, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And as I said in November 2015, I cannot help feeling we're like frogs in boiling water. We have created massive interference in the cosmic fine-tuning phenomenon. The World Bank has released their uh, Global Economic Prospects report, slow growth policy challenges. Global economic growth is forecast to edge up to 2.5% in 2020 as investment and trade gradually recover from last year's significant weakness, but downward risks persist. Growth among advanced economies as a group is anticipated to slip to 1.4% in 2020. Growth in emerging market and developing economies ex is expected to accelerate this year to 4.1%. US growth is forecast to slow to 1.8%. Euro area growth is projected to slip to a downwardly revised 1% in 2020. And downside risks to the global outlook predominate and their materialization could slow growth substantially. They're worried about debt. The history of past waves of debt accumulation show that these waves tend to have unhappy endings. In a fragile global environment, policy improvements are critical to minimize the risks associated with the current debt wave. They're calling it the fourth wave, recent debt buildup in emerging and developing economies, there have been four waves of debt accumulation in the last 50 years. The latest wave, which started in 2010, has seen the largest, fastest and most broad-based increase in debt among the four. Current low levels of interest rates mitigate some of the risks associated with high debt. So growth in the region uh, is projected to ease to 5.7% 2020, that's East Asia and the Pacific, reflecting a further moderate slowdown in China to 5.9% this year. I don't believe that China number. Europe and Central Asia regional growth is expected to firm to 2.6% in 2020. In Brazil, they're expecting growth to accelerate to 2%. Mexico seen rising to 1.2%. Argentina anticipated to contract by a slower 1.3%. Caribbean, 5.6%. Iran's economy is expected to stabilize after a contractionary year as the impact of US sanctions tapers and oil production and exports stabilize. Algeria, 1.9%. Higher investment and private consumption are expected to support a rise to 5.8% in full year 2020 in Egypt. India um, projected to slow to 5% in full year 2019-2020, which ends March 31st, and they're looking for a recovery to 5.8% in the following fiscal year. I don't see that happening. Sub-Saharan Africa, regional growth 
is expected to pick up to 2.9% in 2020. South Africa expected to pick up to 0.9%. Nigeria, 2.1%. West African Economic and Monetary Union growth is expected to hold steady at 6.4%. Kenya growth is seen edging up to 6%. Uh, a resurgence of financial stress in large emerging markets, an escalation of geopolitical tensions or a series of extreme weather events could all have adverse effects on economic activity. The largest, fastest, most broad-based wave of debt accumulation in advanced economies as well as in emerging and developing economies in the last 50 years. Geopolitical risks remain acute globally and in several regions. Social unrest has been on the rise in a growing number of countries in various regions motivated by discontent about some combination of inequality, slow growth, governance and economic policy. Unrest has the potential to disrupt activity. I wrote about this in the New Economy of Anger. If you want to dive more deeply into what we're talking about debt and calling the fourth wave, there's a link for that as well. Total EMDE debt reached almost 170% of GDP in 2018, $55 trillion, an increase of 54 percentage points of GDP since 2010. China accounted for the bulk of this increase. Low-income countries reached 67% of GDP in 2018, up from 48% of GDP in 2010. As I wrote last year, it is a Wizard of Oz world when it comes to debt. Turning to the currency markets, Euro dollar 111.09, dollar index 97.406, Japanese yen 109.59, that's been softening quite sharply. Swiss franc 0 0.9730, the pound 130.85, had a poor session yesterday. Australian dollar rebounding 0.6882 after better retail sales figures. Indian rupee 71.06, South Korean won 11.5961, the real 409.38, Egypt pound below 16, that's bullish 15.9952 and the RAND also firm at 14.2123. This is a chart of the dollar index from the market here, quickly approaching the upper part of the trend channel and the 200-day moving average. A lot of people got bullish again with this technical formation, but I think it's going to break down again. Euro dollar 111.09, this chart is from FX Pip Titan, Tesla traded its highest notional value in history yesterday um, and really it is the most extraordinary short squeeze ever seen in my lifetime and for that I can understand why Elon Musk was doing a jig in China. This airplane is designed by clowns who in turn are supervised by monkeys, said one Boeing company pilot. Of course, we've got this Iranian, uh, Ukrainian plane crash out of Imam Khomeini Airport, um, but it's not clear to me what the facts are, so I'm not going to speak about that. Gold, um, after that huge rally where it touched $1,600, is now at $1,546. Sub-Saharan Africa, African Spring Economic Winter, says the Africa Confidential. Fresh from signal victories in Khartoum and Algiers, youthful mass movements are demanding jobs, opportunities and accountability as financial uncertainty grows. Two developments in the past year will be of seismic importance in 2020, the revolutionary movements in Algeria and Sudan and the start of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. The tensions between the aspirations of Africa's overwhelmingly young 1.2 billion people and the continent's sluggish economic progress is palpable throughout the continent's 30 million square kilometers. In several countries, especially in the bigger economies such as Algeria, Nigeria and South Africa, where hopes are highest, the political temperature is close to boiling point. 
It will take many years to change Africa's economic game to reach its first target of a single market with a GDP of over $3 trillion, bigger than India's today, but the trade treaty is the essential first step, they say. Certainly, the battle for African hearts and minds is heating up. Expect to hear more claims from the United States, which is due to announce its own new initiatives in Africa about how China's prolific lending based on resource deals threatens a new debt crisis for Africa. And then you've got Moscow hoping for more natural resource deals backed by diplomacy and security assistance. Several massive deals are in the pipeline. Um, and basically a bunch of uh, big uh, Africa summits coming up as well. Um, the World Bank growth in sub-Saharan Africa moderated to a slower than expected 2.4% in 2019. They're projecting it to firm to 2.9% in 2020 and 3.2% in 2021. Feeble economic recovery in sub-Saharan Africa has lost momentum with growth in 2019 estimated to have edged down to 2.4% from 2.6%. Angola, Nigeria and South Africa, the three largest economies in the region, growth was subdued in 2019, well below historical averages and contracting for a fifth consecutive year on a per capita basis. And that's highly problematical. It means people are actually worse off. Activity in Nigeria was lackluster. Macroeconomic policy in the business environment remain unconducive to strong domestic demand. Growth in 2019 is estimated to have remained broadly unchanged at 2%. South Africa growth remained anemic in 2019 as it fell to an estimated 0.4%. Activity in Angola is estimated to have contracted by 0.7% in 2019. Oil output declined for the fourth consecutive year. Sudan, the fourth largest economy in the region, political instability alongside an ongoing currency crisis has caused activity to contract sharply. However, the formation of a three-year interim government to oversee the country's transition to democracy helped improve stability in the second half of last year. And I'm bullish about them and their prime minister. Per capita incomes contract among some of the largest economies that account for one third of the region's poor, Angola, Nigeria, Sudan. Um, Kenya growth is expected to remain solid but soften somewhat as accommodative monetary policy does not fully offset the impact of a fiscal tightening. I think they were bullish. Balance of risks for Sub-Saharan Africa is firmly to the downside. Government debt in the region is expected to reach 62% of GDP on average in 2020, up from its trough of 39% of GDP in 2011. Countries with elevated debt burdens are susceptible to sudden increases in investor risk aversion, Angola, Ghana, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia. Extreme weather events are becoming more frequent as the climate changes, posing a significant downside risk to activity due to the dis disproportionate role played by agriculture and many economies in the region. 9th of December, I wrote an article saying, time to big up the dosage of quaaludes. I said, then we're at a pivot moment, and if we keep regurgitating the same old mantras like a stuck record, this will turn Ozymandias. World Bank cut Ethiopia growth forecast to 6.3%, below National Bank of Ethiopia's 10.8%, annual inflation in the Horn of Africa nation was 19.5% in December. So that's quite a difference between the two. A very good article by Ebebe Emro Selassie, who's the Africa director for the IMF, about Ethiopia's recent economic performance. Since 1990, per capita income in the world has increased by about 50%. For the median sub-Saharan African country, this increase was 45%. In the case of Ethiopia, it was over 200%. Economic transformation risks being stifled because the software that is as important for effective industrialization is missing things like access to credit and sufficient foreign exchange for the private sector. Growth in Ethiopia on average has been 8.1% 2000 to 2010. 9.5% 2010 to 2018, 
This compares with 5.6 and 5.9% respectively in other fast-growing countries in SSA. Rate of increase in public debt relative to GDP is comparable to the other country groupings, but the scale of borrowing in Ethiopia has been an order of magnitude different. This has pushed up debt vulnerability ratios, placing Ethiopia at high risk of debt distress, according to the IMF World Bank Debt Sustainability Analysis. Exports as a share of GDP remain well below that of comparators, even as imports have risen sharply. Exports as a share of GDP has actually declined in recent years, which is highly unusual. Uh, Charlie Robertson, the big success that is Ethiopian Airlines helps bring in more dollars to Ethiopia than everything physical that the country exports, mainly coffee and flowers, other food and mild narcotics. Textile exports virtually non-existent. Remittances are huge. I wrote an article, Ethiopia Rising, have a look, that was 90 days into Abby's term. The improvement in Ethiopia with regard to a halving of under five mortality rates, a decade added to life expectancy, and a threefold rise in secondary high school enrollment is spectacular. President Museveni has finished walking, uh, replicating his bush war. He, we walked to Kinsey after we'd been attacked. We'd lost many things. We had no blankets, so we tried warming up with fire. You warm your back and the front get, gets cold. And I also did an interview with William Pike, who's the author of a memoir of the Bush War. He too went into the bush to interview the guerrilla leader at that time, Museveni, and has some very interesting observations. Back to the one-party state, Africa confidential, civil and political rights will remain constrained as Magafuli seeks a landslide in the general election to endorse his status division. October general election will dominate 2020. Um, <clears throat> in October, when landslide victories for the CCM can be expected at presidential, parliamentary and council levels, the challenge this year will be carry it off and still maintain some legitimacy. Landslide victories can be expected. That's the question. Can they maintain any legitimacy after what we've witnessed? Africa, uh, South Africa business confidence falls to a three-decade low in 2019, uh, declined to an average of 92.6 from a two-year high of 95.5 in 2018 when there was all that ramaphoria. Um, uh, very bearish. Um, as Charlie said, uh, South Africa is heading for a downgrade and there's a meme flying around on social media that there is a new sex position called the Ramaphosa, get on top and do nothing. South African all shares up 0.8%, dollar rand 15.20, Egyptian pound 15.99, inflation ticked higher, EGX 30 minus 1.66% so far this year. Nigeria stocks have had a storming start to 2019. It's now up 9.51% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange down 0.71% year to date. Isabel Dos Santos, this is an interview with Daniel Knowles and The Economist lives modestly these days. She arrived on foot to meet your correspondent at a smart hotel in London and at the end of the interview, she disappeared off towards a tube station. Um, stepped down for a woman who once flew the rapper Nicki Minaj to Luanda at a cost of millions. But these days, Africa's most prominent businesswoman has good reason to play it cool. Ms. Dos Santos, who has not set foot in Angola since 2018, insists that she is popular. Lots of Angolans see me as a role model, she says. Uh, economist about this Al-Shabaab attack. Al-Shabaab anyway is doing well. It's killed more people in 2019 than in any year since 2010. Tourists visiting Kenya's lovely Lamu archipelago are normally stirred from their slumber by pleasant sounds such as gently lapping waves or the call to prayer drifting across the water. But on January 5th, some were woken by the less melodious rattle and crump of distant battle. Across Manda Bay on the mainland, fighters from Al-Shabaab were engaged in an unusually daring assault on American forces stationed at the Kenyan airbase. 
The attack, which lasted several hours, was startlingly effective. The jihadists, probably more, no more than 15 of them, managed to kill three Americans, one soldier and two security contractors, wreck six aircraft, some used by America's armed forces for snooping missions across the Somali border. Never before had Al-Shabaab targeted a facility housing American troops outside Somalia. Africa confidential about Kenya. Kenya began 2020 with erratic and intractable factional politics as the two top candidates for the next presidential election, William Ruto and Raila Odinga, counter each other's attempts to cobble together alliances from their bases in their respective ethnic homelands. As money changes hands on an epic scale, parliamentarians and county leaders are switching parties and alignments at a bewildering pace. World Bank estimates 5.8% growth in 2019 and 6% in 2020. I think they're being over-optimistic. There's panic, as locusts are now spotted in Meru. Um, as I said previously, it feels fantasy air clear changes which are actually taking place at these junctures tend to acquire extra, sometimes mystical layers of meaning a decade of semiotic arousal where everything it seemed was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. These are locusts currently terrorizing Kenya, Isiolo, but they've also moved to Meru. Aidan Hartley says, My late father described locusts devastating East Africa in the 1930s, but international action later tackled the problem. That took me back to Revelation when he opened the sixth seal. I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sack sackcloth, assuming that's locusts. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. Nairobi all shares up 2.73%, strong start. NSE 20 is up 1.43%. Sogo Sun Hotels confirm that the Southern Sun Mayfair in Nairobi in Kenya will not renew its lease and will officially cease operations on January 31, 2020. A lot of these older hotels are laying off a lot of staff and I think it's part disruption, part competition. Hope you enjoy the weekend.